God, in Jesus' name, we give you praise for your word and thanks for your word in advance. We thank you for just the privilege of even receiving your word today. And we thank you, Father God, for the Holy Spirit who will teach us and remind us of truths that will transform our life, our relationships, and our life's journey in wonderful and marvelous ways. We thank you for the miracle signs and wonders that will happen in my heart and happen in my home, in our homes, because of your word. We thank you that you will send forth your word and it heals and delivers and it sets us free from any destructive force, foe, any depression, discouragement, or any discord that may be happening in our homes or in our lives. In Jesus' name, we give you all the praise, all of the credit, all of the honor, and all of the glory, Lord. And it's in that wonderful name we pray and say, Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, and we're going to start uh, this with, uh, preface our series, uh, we're in the Move series, and we're talking about today moving from anger, angst, and ought to agape. And you know, some people say, why well, make uh, resolutions or New Year's goals? This is a big one, I believe, as the Lord has described to me, because, you know, 2021, 2020, excuse me, left a lot of people angry. And a lot of people have angst about 2021. So they have, they're angry about 2020 and all the negative things and the nagging things that have occurred. And, and, and unfortunately, because of relationship, relational schisms or situations, some people are carrying oughts in their heart. In our previous two messages on the MOVE series, we shared with you the importance of movement and moving from being a victim to being in victory. Last week, we talked about uh, moving from fright or fear to fight, fighting the good fight of faith. Today, we want to share with you the importance of moving from being angry all the time or operating and dealing in, with life from a place of anger to a place of agape, love. Now, agape is the highest type of love because it's, it is the unconditional, unlimited, unfailing love of God. It's not natural human love. It's God kind of love, the God kind of love. So, so we're we're. As we're stepping into 2021, almost complete with January, we ask ourselves a profound question. Who and what are we mad at? First of all, I want to examine the importance and sometimes forgotten aspect we will most assuredly experience when living the Christian life. This concept is a concept of suffering or simply pain. In 2020, you might conclude that there was a whole lot of suffering or pain. And this suffering caused and fueled a lot of anger. Amen. Triggering and released a whole lot of angst. And for people, in people, and for some, they're still carrying oughts in their heart towards other people into this year already. So 2021 doesn't promise that this year will be pain-free or problem-free either. We've got to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We've got to endure some pain as we walk in God's purpose and plan for our lives. Now, what is anger? I'll give you dic dictionary uh, definitions up front of anger, angst, and oughts, so you have a reference point. A strong anger is a strong feeling of displeasure or rage. It is fury. It is indignation. It is irateness, being irate, mad, or livid. Are you angry? <laughs> Angst is, is a word that means the feeling of anxiety, apprehension, or insecurity. It's antagonism springing from a root of anger. 
Some people have angst. Arts is simply one word. Anything. If you got anything against anybody. Some people have things against a certain people group. Certain color group. Certain cultural group. You sh ought not to have arts. <laughs> so let's talk about the reality and responses to pain a little bit. Let's look at Jesus here. Jesus in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 through 10. It says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than angels for the suffering. The suffering. Everybody say suffering. Suffering of death. So he had to suffer. You know, if our Lord suffered, guess what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to suffer. Now, three outstanding gentlemen here in this room who played young men who played football. I watched, got the privilege of watching all of them play a little bit, you know, just a little snapshots of you, yours. But they can tell you, one of the main goals when they hit the gym and when they went to work out and practice, no pain, no what? No pain, no gain. See, he, he, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, by which he, uh, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone, for it was fitting for him, for whom were all things, and by whom were all things, to bring many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through what? So he's like the captain of the football team. So if he went through pain, and suffering. See, people want to follow Jesus in salvation, but they don't want to follow and be faithful to Jesus through suffering. No pain, no gain. <laughs> now, First Peter 5, 5. Look at this. First Peter 5, 5 and 10. It talks about Peter's talking about us by the Holy Spirit. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive one to another and be clothed with what? Humility. Now, that's Sometimes that's hard for people because they're haughty. Sometimes that's difficult because people are, uh, are a legend in their own mind. For God resists the proud, but give grace to the who? The humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that you may exalt your, he may exalt you in due, due time. In other words, to get promoted, you got to you got to demote yourself. You got to demote before you promote. Some, some people, and unfortunately in this self-ish or self-centered generation, we like self-promotion. But God says the kingdom is counter to that. We have to be self-demotion. That means the way to go up, you got to go down. Amen. We talked about that last, uh, last, last week quite a bit, the three steps to humility. He said, uh, um, Casting all your cares upon him, be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him and as steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same, there's that word again, sufferings, the same sufferings, are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called you into eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered, there it is that we're in. A little while. <laughs> Perfect, establish, and strengthen and settle you. Now let me define this word suffer or sufferings is the Greek word panthema. Um, hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. But it's something, something on, undergone, undergone. That's what it means. It means hardship or pain. Subjectively an emotion or influence. Uh, so we're not talking about suffering sickness. We're not talking about suffering from some illness or virus or disease. We're not talking about suffering poverty and lack and insufficiency. We're talking about suffering not getting to do everything you want to do. Suffering by telling yourself, no, I shouldn't go there. I shouldn't be there. I shouldn't talk like I'm there. That means Jesus is your Lord and he is not only your master, ruler, and owner, but he's also the, your controller. He controls your time. He dictates and directs your talent. And he controls, through you, your money. 
Well, praise the Lord. Because sometimes it's suffering when you can't when you can't hit up Amazon real quick and get that thing you want to get. Amen. Thank God for Amazon. Thank God for e-commerce. Thank God they can deliver stuff right to your house. But sometimes you got to suffer. <laughs> Not getting everything you want and our greedy little eyes want to get. Because if he tells you like uh, uh, we've learned in our Tuesday night class, give away your car, give away your house. Empty out your checking account or your bank account and give all your money away. Then he tells you, do you trust me? But most people say, Lord, you're too hard. You're too hard. <laughs> Suffering, having to get up early. I had the experience again this week, past week. Well, I was woken up early by the Lord before 5 o'clock. And I always ask the Lord, and I always I had to catch myself, why did I ask him that? I said, Lord, did you know what time it is? <laughs> <laughs> you realize what time it is? He said, well, well, he always comes back at me something funny. He says, he says, well, this is about the time when your mind is clear and empty, and I know I can get your undivided attention. Because sometimes we're so busy. We may not be so bad, but we are so busy that we go to sleep with everything on our mind. We got, we got games on our mind. We got, uh, we got stuff on our mind. Amen. And God said, I can get your attention where nobody else can bother you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So pain is suffering. Uh, four things. Write these things down. Uh, the suffering of persecution from people. Persecution is simply the public or private backbiting, criticizing, ostracizing, castigation, threats, hostile pursuits of intimidation or harassment by others. Persecution comes through the vehicle of people. When people wag their tongues behind your back or in your face, you are under persecution. But we're supposed to suffer persecution. <laughs> really, um, it, you could say it's twofold. Some people praise you and some people persecute you. You shouldn't listen to either. Because if you listen to all the praise and you pat yourself on the back and everybody else and you feed on that, you're going to get blown up. You're going to go up in pride. If you listen to all the negative, the noise, the naysayers, the people who are a nuisance to you, they're always nagging you then you're going to have uh, self-esteem issues. And you think, I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. Whose report are we supposed to believe? Everybody say it, the report of the Lord. You, you're supposed to believe the report of the Lord. Amen. All right? Number two, pressure of circumstances. This is all under the category of pain, pressure of circumstances. Circumstances have, a, have an innate or inherent tendency to bring pressure to bear. Where does that pressure apply? It's usually called stress, worry, all those things, fear, pushed up against your mind, your soul realm. Why? What does it do? It makes you uh, come, uh, uh, um, second guess your belief system. In other words, am I going to believe in God and trust in God, or am I going to believe what I feel right now, I feel a lot of pressure, or what I see at the moment? So pressure gets, tries to push your trust away from God and his word to what you feel and what you see. Everybody say that's pain. So you got to endure pain. In other words, uh, these gentlemen that played football, they know that when you hit that the tackling dummy, they, they coaches yell at you, hit it right. That's how you hit, that's how you tackle. <laughs> Amen. That's how you block. You got to come against that pressure. But it's painful sometimes because you're hurting yourself. I mean, it's hurtful to your flesh. And uh, enduring this pressure sometimes will not be easy and comfortable on your flesh. Number three, peril. The perils of dangers and disasters. We've seen a lot of that here in the last year and even in the beginning of this year. You know, different things and dangers. 
Number four, problems or difficulties, dilemmas, and diseases. Life is not guaranteed to be problem free. So you, you got to ask yourself this key question. Do you want to get, be a better Christian in 2021? Then you got to move. In other words, in this area, you got to move up. You got to grow your ability or your threshold of pain. You got to grow your threshold of pain. No pain, no gain. No suffering, no glory. You got to pay the price. The price tag of pursuing the will of God and the purpose and plan of God for your life is the endurance of pain. The undergoing of suffering. Do you want our church or your church, wherever you're watching from, to grow or your personal business to reach higher goals? Well, then your reluctance to pain is your greatest limitation. Now, many people will endure it physically. They'll work out. They're worked out to a nauseam. They'll, they'll stress their body. But they won't have anything to do with pain in their heart or pain in their head. <laughs> they can't handle it. See, there's no growth without change and no change without loss and no loss without pain. So you'll grow only to the threshold of your pain. Listen to this it, scripture. Listen to how many times it's referenced grow in Ephesians 4, 15, and 16. Look at Ephesians 4, 15, and 16. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Instead, we speak the truth in love, growing in every way, more and more like Christ. Growing in every way. So to grow more every way, every day, like Christ, we have to endure pain. who is the head of the body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work and helps the other parts grow. Say this with me. See, my growth, say my growth, my growth. helps other people grow. Say this. Say it this way. My growth, my growth helps the church to grow. So if I'm not growing, then I'm, I'm hurting the church growth. Amen. So the whole body is healthy, listen to this, and growing and full of love. The whole body is healthy. Three times it's referenced in the word grow. We ought to automatically see that and say, that means I got to endure more pain. Instead, a lot of times people get angry because it's uncomfortable. Pain is uncomfortable. Some people carry angst in their soul or some people have aughts in their heart. But God is saying this morning, move from that and move to agape. What drove Jesus to the cross? Our sins, your sins. He said, I'm going to take the pain for your gain. What, 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 what caused him to endure the slapping, the beatings, the spitting, the scourging on his back, the whips on his back? The nails in his, uh, uh, his hands and feet and the, and the piercing in his side without saying a negative word. He was taking the pain for yours and my gain. Look at 2 Peter 2, 3.18, New Living Church. Rather, you must grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Grow, 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 grow. Remember, growth is messy. Some people only grow to the size of their problem. And not to the level of their potential. What is your potential this morning? Because people know when the problem comes, when it's certain size, they say, don't supersize it. I just want it the right size. I want it the right size. Because I'm just going to only change to the level and the size of my problem. I'm not going to change or grow to the level of my potential. And see, if you're growing, ladies and gentlemen, and the more people will dislike something you are doing. Not everybody likes, likes growth because you, when you're in a community or a city where, it's a, where people have crab mentalities, 
In other words, if you lived on the East Coast, you know what crabs are. Uh, and they, what do they do? What they, the crabs in a bucket. They pull the other one down all the time. No, none of the crabs can get out because they don't want you to go any further. They don't want you to change. They don't want you to fall more in love with Jesus. They don't want you to follow Jesus fully. <laughs> Are y'all here this morning? <laughs> See, when you're growing, people are going to dislike something you're doing. And, 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 and this, at times, makes people angry. They're going to start wagging their tongues at you. Why are you going to church so much? Why are you reading the Bible? How come you don't play like we used to play? Some people hold on to angst. They get nervous because you're changing. Or they have aughts against you. See, these changes, transitions... And growth tend to draw out critics, cynics, and complainers. So if you're a sensitive soul, so to speak, to the point where it bothers you, then you need to grow your pain threshold. There will be more opportunities this year to feel pain. So it's going to be painful for many people from coming to church to watch to having to come to church when God when God begins to flow and and people start running back to God, they have to say, "Well, I'm coming. I can't come to church just to watch. I got to come to church to work." See what the pandemic taught us was that we were been real good at coming to church, but now the command and the commission and mandate is that we are to be really good at being the church. See, it's easy to become emotionally drained, spiritually depleted, physically fatigued. There's, there's, there's the kinds of things that start happening, and there are three conditions or characteristics that we're in the danger zone for people at home or job and ministry. What are the three conditions? Everything becomes a problem. Remember, to be angry means to be irate, to be livid, to be uh, mad. Some people are just downright mad and mean and they're born again child of god spirit filled supposedly tongue talking but everything's a problem there's a hesitancy to, to reach out because the number number of times you've reached out and can, reached up to communicate and connect with others somehow your good intentions were abused so you say i'm not going to be bothered with nobody well, that's not love. That's perhaps angst or perhaps aughts in your heart. Number three, you're, you're not going through the motions. You're just going through the motions. You're a zombie. What are these? I'm at my limit of pain. I'm at my limit of pressure. Psalms 34 verse 19 says it this way. Psalms 34, 19 says it this way. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of all. Now, he didn't say any afflictions come to the right. He said many. So what should we expect? Many afflictions coming to us as the righteous. John 16, 33 says, he said, in this world, you shall have what? Tribulations, tests, trials, and trouble. But he said, be of good cheer. Uh, I have overcome the world. I've disarmed it. I've stripped it of its power to harm you. In other words, Jesus said, I had to overcome, so you will have to overcome, but be of good cheer because I've overcome. You can overcome. But in this world, you're going to have tests, trials, and trouble. Amen? So what's the point of truth? The reality of pain is inevitable, but the, resp our, the response to pain is our choice. That means in 2021, there's going to be some hard times. There's going to be some heavy days. There's going to be some heated moments. Well, Pastor, that's not all positive. No, I'm not trying to give you a pie in the sky. Amen. Because some people have misconceptions about Christianity that everything is going to be a flowery rose bed of ease. But I'm telling, sitting up here telling you, January 24th, this morning, that no pain, no what? No pain, no gain. So here's our responses to pain. Number one, we curse the pain. 
when we curse the pain, we became a blamer. We accuse and transfer the blame for any and everything on others. We live with misguided expectations of pain. In other words, you're the problem to my pain. You're the source and root cause of my pain. You're cursing the pain. You can nurse the pain. When we nurse the pain, we become bitter. A victim, not a victor. Incessantly angry, upset all the time, and constantly irritable. Anybody know anybody like that? Number three, we re rehearse the pain. That means we batter and bruise ourselves because we're constantly playing that DVD or that CD or that tape in our mind that we batter and bruise ourselves. Hurting people hurt other people. You easily burn out and mentally and emotionally break down. Why? Due to self-inflicting, self-sabotaging, and self-defeating behavior. Then we reverse the pain. So those are four responses. Number four is the only one you should be doing. We become better. Through the empowerment of God's grace and the exercise of your faith, you walk through and walk, work out the pain with cheerful endurance, perseverance, mental positivity, and power. In other words, when I, when I, when I ask that question, what am I mad at? Who am I mad at? Why do I have this angst in my soul? Why am I? Do I carry and harbor these thoughts in my heart? Then I need to start reversing the pain. How do you do it? Through love. Now here's, here's some of the dangers of anger, angst, and aughts. Mark 11, 22 it, 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 through 26, it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say to this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith, uh, those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. And when you stand praying, do what? Forgive. If you have aught against, how many? Any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, uh, forgive neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses praise God and so uh, we see here that your prayers uh, and your faith won't work if you don't forgive because that's the danger of having an ought Amplify says or, or New Living if you have anything against anyone remember an ought is anything some people have in something against their employer some people have something against their boss or supervisor. Some, th some people always have something against their company. Some people have uh, something against the local community leaders. Something, somebody has something against someone or something that always carries with it the price tag of an ought in our heart. Glory to God. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, it says, Be angry and sin not. Do not let the sun go down on your, what? Your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no more. Let, it, let, let him labor, working with his hands, the, the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. And grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away with you with all malice. And be kind uh, one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. So back in, in, in Mark eleven twenty five, we're told by Jesus that if we have, we're not to have aughts against any, not just many. So that means don't hold hostility, unforgiveness, animosity, or ill will in your heart against anybody for anything. We see the ex expiration tag here in this verse, these verses, uh, for unresolved or unrighteous anger is sunset. Now, if you see this in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, he said, don't let the sun go down on your what? 
So one of the things we have to go to and move from is being angry for days to being only mad and angry and it expire by the end of the day. You see people carrying anger all the way through by days and weeks. They're smoldering. They're, they're, they've got, uh, uh, they're spitting up and spewing hatred. Particularly on social media, sometimes there's a whole lot of internet or social media anger. And the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, if it's not resolved, if it's not righteous, then it has an expiration tag. It's the biblical sunset rule. Amen. It's because if it does overnight, it doesn't get better over time. It will metastasize and we will either be homicidal or suicidal or both. That means you're going to hurt someone else or you're going to hurt yourself. Who are you mad at? What are you mad at? What do you have angst about? What do you have arts in your heart for? See, the progressive steps of unresolved anger are revealed to us here in Ephesians 4. Look at these three emotions that are listed. Uh, verse 29. Ver I'm sorry, verse uh, 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger. <laughs> these are uh, deadly emotions, but if they're buried alive, they never die. So if you go to bed with bitterness, that bitterness did not cease or die. These deadly emotions buried alive, they never will die. So these are progressive steps of the emotion of anger. Bitterness is the start. Wrath is next. That's the, uh, the word we use uh, in the Greek, the, that's used in the Greek for thermostat, this thumos. Thumos quickly blows up and subsides. That means people are blowing up, blowing their head gasket, blowing their top, so to speak. But, but it quickly subsides. So that's the external expression of anger. The one more deadly and the highest emotion to, to, to keep in your heart is anger. This is the word that's mentioned more in the New Testament than the other word, thumos. This is the word orge. Orge or orgizo is the hidden emotion of anger. That means this is an anger that has an eye toward revenge. It has a get even, I got you back, I will get you back. I'm going to punish you. I'm going to inflict pain on you somehow, some way. He said, let all of it, how much of it? All of it. That means we got to move from being bitter. We got to move from being angry. We got to move from the hidden emotion of anger. Now look at the next three things. And anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Now listen, listen to this. These are volume levels or vocalization or vocalizing our anger, angst, and aughts. When we're vocalizing these things, there's something wrong with our heart. He says what? Clamor. I think we got the definition in there for you. Noisy shouting, loud continual noise, instant, insistent protests. Are we seeing that today? People insistently protesting, clamoring, and second, evil speaking. Well, what happens there? You start slandering. You start detracting. Your speech is injurious to another person's good name. When you speak evil against another Christian, you're speaking, bless you, you're speaking evil against the church. And then eventually you speak evil against your pastor. When you speak evil against someone, you contribute to their downfall, their demise, and their destruction. 
In other words, we would say legally and uh, police officer wise, you're a co-conspirator in that crime. You contribute toward their demise, their downfall, because you speak evil. You become a persecutor and therefore you get prosecuted. Your words matter. Now, remember, your words are the most powerful things. So if, so if you talk about someone behind the scenes, it's just like you on the scene talking about them. Because your words are powerful and you have to take them seriously. By your words, you're justified. By your words, you're either condemned. So when you speak evil... And some people are real good at not speaking, but they're posting. But it's coming from them anyway. When you speak injurious to another person's name, reproachful speech, blasphemy, or you operate in vilif vilifying or vilification of people, then you are evil speaking. Evil, we said, is anything or anyone that takes you or them away from their God-intended plan or purpose. Now, God intends anybody, you know, the new election team is in. He plans, what's his purpose for them? For all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of truth. What about that bad, evil, uh, or perhaps perceived evil boss you have? No, he, he's, his plan is that they get saved and come into the knowledge of truth. So you can't speak evil against your boss. You can't speak evil against your company because that company will now become contrary and contradictory to your prosperity and to your peace on that job. When you speak evil about your boss and your, and your employees, coworkers, and your supervisor, then you're contributing to your own pain and problem. I know this is not a shout running around the church missing. Praise God. But I'm encouraged. Praise God. Hallelujah. Third is malice. It's ma malignity, Ill, Ill will, spite, a desire to injure. That means you desire to inflict pain and punishment. Wickedness not, that is not ashamed to break laws. You got Christians talking about that. they're going to they're gonna take somebody out. I've even had, saw Christians post that say, anybody come at my door, I'm going to shoot. Why is the first response we're going to kill people? Jesus even said, if you hate your brother without a cause, is your murderous at heart. Oh, God, we got to move from anger. We got to move from angst. We got to move from carrying oughts. You see how important this is? Now listen to some scriptures here, and this is enough. These are enough scriptures here that I'm getting ready to give you that are worth for you to comb your hair and come to church this morning or to watch online. These scriptures are just enough right by themselves. Listen to this. This is anger management, anger and angst management 101. Listen to this. Psalms 37 verse 8. Most of these are New Living and some are the New King James. But it says, stop being angry. Turn to someone next to you and say, stop being angry. <laughs> Turn from your rage. Do not lose your temper. It only leads to harm. <laughs> it's Proverbs fifteen one. Gentle a gentle anchor deflects the gentle answer, excuse me, deflects anger. And harsh words make tempers flare. Man it'd be good for that to happen in houses, right? When somebody's hollering and screaming, then you back it down and bring them down. Soft answers turn away the wrath. That means you don't answer harsh, or Peter says, don't answer insult for insult or railing for railing. In other words, they get loud, you get louder. No, that's not the way you, you're doing it wrong. You're not operating in anger management from the scriptures. Your gentle anger, gentle answers will deflect that anger. Your soft answers will turn away wrath. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 7, 9, control your temper for anger labels you a fool. Are you a hothead? Do you heat up real quickly? Now, two things here I'm just going to share with you. Just You need to understand, and you need to really have the Holy Spirit partner with you with, is you got to know your burn rate. That means how quickly do, do you burn up 
or burn out. Two ways you burn. You could burn out, that means you, your fire is gone. You can burn up, that means you create a blaze, a bonfire. That means how quickly do you get angry and upset. You got to know your limits. You got to know when to cut the TV off because you could get anger fueled into you and fed into you through the news. And you don't like it, and you're getting angry, and you're starting to verbalize anger toward the television. <laughs> oh, shit, I'm preaching real good. And what happened, the devil doesn't mean for you to be innocently anger. You're going you're gonna to then release that anger toward other things and other people around you. Because you're irate at the moment. You're livid. You're mad. Control your temper for your anger labels you. And then your bounce, the other thing you need to know is your bounce back. When you get hit, when you get hurt, how quickly do you bounce back? In life and in 2021, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you up front, it's not necessarily great news, but it's reality news. You will get hit and you may get hurt. But how do you bounce back? You know, I played football. I got hit a lot. You know, I play defensive back and receiver. And I get crushed on a play, particularly as a receiver. My goodness. And a coach, coach would be, I mean, I'm hurting all over. My eyebrows are hurting. And, and the coach would say, bounce, come, but shake it off, shake it off, shake it off, son. Shake it off, son. Get back in there. And I'm like, I don't want to get back in there. I'm hurt. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anybody ever been hit like that? You know, you've been hit in life by that. And the Holy Spirit, our coach says, shake it off, son. Shake it off, daughter. Shake it off, man of God. Shake it off, woman of God. Get back in there. You got to know your bounce back factor. Some people get hit by a disease or they they out for two or three weeks. You got to get better than that. Well, praise the Lord. Proverbs 15, 18. A watchful, a wrathful man, excuse me, a wrathful man stirs up strife. But he who is slow to anger allays contention. Proverbs 22, 34. Make no friendship with an angry man. Now, who is the, is the group you're running with? If they're angry, you're going to be an angry person. Because your relationships matter. You are who you hang around. If you got people that are always mad and always fussing and cussing and miserable, guess what? You next. <laughs> Hallelujah. Make no friendships with an angry man and with a furious man. Do not go. Don't run in the car with him because you don't want an angry driver. Well, praise the Lord. Some people drive angry. Some people drive angry and you're hearing them yell at every car around them. Let me drive myself. Let me get my car. <laughs> Praise God, because I don't want that spirit in me. Praise God. Proverbs 29, 11. Fools vent their anger, but wise quietly hold it back. Ah, so our anger can be determined, our, our anger management determines if we're foolish or wise. Proverbs 29, 22. An angry person starts fights. A hot-tempered person commits all kinds of what? Hmm. Big one here. James 1, 19, 20. Understand this. That means we need to make a note of this and remember this. My dear brothers and sisters, you must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Now, what words is he using? here? He's using orgizo, orge. He's using that Greek word that means the hidden emotion of anger. Be slow to always mark people and say, I'm going to get you back. I'm mad at what you said to me, and I'm going to pay you back. Be slow at that revengeful eye and that vengeance posture. See, human anger, it says human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Why? Because you have the wrong optics. You have the wrong outlook at the situation. Why? Because you're angry. Now let's move and walk in the cure of conquer all of this anger, of this angst, of this oughts. 
it's love and forgiveness. Everybody say love and forgiveness. Who's sometimes, sometimes we think, well, that's a, that's not a good, that's not, I want to get them back. I want to fight. Nope. Hmm. See, your faith walk will never outgrow your forgiveness walk. <laughs> your faith level will never exceed your forgiveness level. See, this anger, like we said in the question at the beginning, who are you mad at? What are you mad at? This anger usually has an object. <laughs> this angst usually has an object with it. <laughs> and so you have to walk in love, but also walk in forgiveness. You've got to move to agape. You've got to walk and talk and live in, in the love of God. See, you got to realize that in life, at home, work, business, church, people will hurt you. And when you get hurt, two things occur. Write these down. Two things occur. Number one is the action, what they did or what they said. What they did and what they said, the action. Forgiveness deals with the action. If you don't deal with the forgiveness, if you don't give forgiveness, then the action will bother you. It will hurt you worse than the action hurts you. This is good stuff. Matthew 5, 44 says, Jesus said this, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Love who? He starts with the extreme opposite. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. In other words, curse just one definition is to say something bad about it. So somebody says something bad about you. But he says, you bless those, say something good about them, that say something bad about you. Now, some people stumble or struggle with that practice. They cursing you, they calling you everything but a child of God. They calling you names, they labeling you a loser or, or, or a liar or whatever. And, and, they, and, and you're, you're, they're sitting up there cursing you, say, saying something bad about you. You're supposed to respond by saying something good about them. Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy this morning. <laughs> you know, you, whew, they get me more and more. Man, I'm going to wring my neck and they're they going to have it. I'm going to bring, bring my, my old unsanctified cusser. Well, you're not walking in love and forgiveness. He said, do good to those that hate you. What? Are you kidding me? <laughs> that means cook their favorite dinner. Do something really good for them, even though they've done something really bad to you. And it says, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. You know they're using you, they're abusing you. But he said, pray for them. How much carpet time are you spending for other people? Now, see, next week we're going to talk about move from just having a prayer list to a prayer life. And it's going to be powerful. You don't want to miss it. But most people only have a prayer list. And it doesn't include their enemies. And it doesn't include those that use them despitefully or persecuting them. They're not praying for other people, but their three favorite people. Me, myself, and I, or mine. Mark eleven twenty five. Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them. Your Father which is in heaven also may forgive you your trespass. See, walking in forgiveness and walking in love, forgiveness should be practiced instantly, proactively, reactively, and regularly. Don't go in a restaurant mad. Because it's crowded and the wait is 20 minutes or more. And they tell you to go sit in your car. <laughs> you better start practicing proactive forgiveness. Lord, I forgive everybody. The wait staff that's maybe understaffed. The cooks in the back that's cooking the food, I forgive them. Because if they don't get, this, they don't get my steak correct, you know how some people are. They don't get my steak right, man, they're going to have it. Sending it back two or three times. Woo! Glory to God. Preach it, Pastor. You're doing real good today. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so
Someone also said that you got to forgive your critics of today and tomorrow. When so you wake up and you head out the door, somebody's going to say something against you. Somebody's going to talk about you. Somebody's going to call you out of your name, perhaps, or, or, or misalign you somehow unrighteously or unjustifiably. Then you say, I forgive my critics today, and I forgive my critics of tomorrow. See, these are things we have to move from and to. Uh, James uh, Johnny Johnson, he was the undersecretary of the Navy, uh, Christian man, African-American man, and he said this because he was used by God and through the Navy to cure and quell a lot of the racial divide and racial discord that was on the Pacific Fleet. They had some serious issues on those boats, fighting people, busting in people overhead with pipes, bleeding, a lot of racial discord and dis. Uh, uh, upheaval and how did he cure it with the love of God amen he said a lot of people think you can wait until tomorrow to forgive someone he said you can't you don't have the time that thing what thing anger hatred starts growing so fast that if, if that happens you might not be able to control it that's why you can't let the sun go down on your wrath. See, it's a process, as Jesus describes to us, in dealing with the trespassing of others. Number one is let it drop. Then number two is leave it. Number two, let it go. And then number three, you have to give up the resentment, the anger, the angst, the art. You have to give it up. You can't keep it in. You got to give it up. The second thing that occurs when people hurt you is your attitude. We said your action, then your attitude. I'm almost done. Attitude has to do something. You have to do something with your attitude. The Bible says what, whatever we bless, we take away the ability for it to hurt us. So this is the action and then the attitude. You have to deal with the attitude because the attitude will help hold on to that anger. First Peter 3, 9 says this, don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. Now, if we took a poll this morning or we took a poll or survey online, we would ask, how many blessings did you pay back this week? Because it gives us a direct, clear instruction. He said, pay people who insult you and uh, eat, do evil to you, pay them back with a blessing. This is what God has called you to do. Now, this is serious now. This is something I'm commanded and called to do. And he will grant you his blessing. Some people say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm tired and I'm giving. What's going on with my blessing? Lord? What's going on with my increase? What's going on with my prosperity? What's going on with, why is my money funny? Perhaps he's waiting for you to pay others back with a blessing. And then you will get your blessing from him. He even told us. Y'all know the scriptures. If you have an against your brother, leave your gift at the what? At the altar. Then go to your brother and do what? Reconcile. And then come offer your gift. How do you spell release? F-O-R-G-I-V-E-N-E-S-S. -S. Forgiveness. Look at John 20, verse 20. Through 23 and when he had said this he breathed on them and said receive the Holy Spirit if you forgive the sins of any they are for, they are forgiven them if you retain the sins of any of any they are retained guys because we have so much access to information and uh, media today Sometimes we see things that have been exposed or been, been, have been um, brought to light by people. And sometimes we can invariably and mistakenly or even accidentally carry 
that person sins in our heart. We can hear about a family member that fell or fallen away or fallen into sin and uh, ungodliness or wrongdoing, and we can allow that sin to be retained in our soul. But if we retain the sins of people, our sins will be retained against us. And when we ask for forgiveness, God says, I can't give it to you because you haven't given forgiveness. How long should I hold on to, to offenses, trespasses, faults, failings of others? How long? Consider James, Johnny, uh, doc, uh, Johnny, uh, James Johnson. He said a five-second rule. Everybody say five seconds. That means instant forgiveness and unconditional love. That's what we should practice. Instant forgiveness and unconditional love. Don't allow anger and hatred to grow and spread in your heart and the emotions in a harmful and hurtful ways. That means get used to letting it drop, leaving it, letting it go, giving up the resentment within five seconds of that action that has hurt you. Sometimes you may even have to talk back to your device or your TV when you hear something, bad news coming across TV that hurts you. Forgive them. It didn't say you had to like them. But you had to, do, you had to walk in love towards them. See, many people have a difficult time uh, uh, with forgiveness because they don't want to let someone off the hook. You got to get paid. You got to pay the price. You got to, you did the crime. You got to do the time. <laughs> and see, you're not letting the other person off. You're, you're the one that's getting off the hook when you forgive. See, when you forgive, you keep the past in the past. That's why I said in the beginning, you carrying that stuff from 2020. You need to keep the past in the past. And free yourself for God to do new things for you in the present. Somebody say hallelujah. And so we, today, the, 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 my last statement here before I read the last scripture, that we should cultivate a spirit of forgiveness and drop the habit, it's a bad habit, of counting offenses. Colossians 3.13. Make allowances for each other's faults. Forgive of anyone who offends you. Who? Anyone. Forgive anyone who offends you. We, we, we think it see, says avoid them and stay angry at them. No, it didn't say avoid them and stay angry at them. It says forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Praise God. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.